From the headquarters of Omni Consumer Products, it's the IGN DigiGuys. Please welcome two men who are not coming with you, dead or alive, Wade Major and Mark Kaiser. And yes, we will be getting to the new intros. We have to record them. Just it's a scheduling thing. Corey's busy and Mark's busy and I've been busy with, you know, Colcoa and all this other stuff. And, you know, so we, we have to just get our schedules aligned. We'll record the new intros. So everybody hang tight. We'll get to that in the next few weeks. Uh, you, you, you know, last week you just uh, up and like ran, man. I did. Very you busy, did. man. Yeah. Can I say, by the way, how much yeah. I hate Facebook? <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, I I want as many people participating on the DigiGods Facebook page as possible. In fact, the only reason I go on Facebook is to uh, blast out some responses. Uh, of course. But I, and, and I, I know this news is like two weeks old. I totally get that. But I'm saying it anyway. I hate Facebook because, you know, during the whole Boston uh, marathon the, tragedy, the, what, yeah. I go on Facebook and it's like... There's people who went on Facebook because they have friends who live in Boston or family who live in Boston, and maybe they don't know how to get a hold of them, so they go to Facebook and they say, "Sure, yeah, I get that." Yeah, people who lived in Boston before, but then there's people who just go on there, yeah, who have like never been to Boston, never heard of Boston, and they just like say, "My thoughts," are, and I'm not saying it's not genuine, but you know what? It's not genuine. <laughs> you, all you you just you just want to get it on like the bandwagon of going on Facebook to say something. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I just all these people saying things about Boston. Shut up. Nobody and, and then and here's what happens. You, you you do something on Facebook that has nothing to do with your life or, or you have no connection to whatever it is, but you feel like you gotta be part of the conversation. So I'm gonna go on Facebook and be mm-hmm. part of the conversation. Be part of the social media wave of conversation about Boston. Mm-hmm. And then you go on there and you get like three likes. And somehow three likes in a planet of six billion people somehow makes you feel validated. I got three legs. Oh my, my god. My comments about Boston and the thoughts and prayers. You know I what? love you, Facebook. I've made my voice be heard. Now shut up. The, 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 the whole the craving for likes thing has become sort of our new that's like this weird new litmus test to be the most popular kid in school. It's like people liked my comments, strangers I've never even heard of. Here's why I don't care about the likes thing anymore, because I know how it works. No matter how even if I get like five or ten people who will like something that I post. If I post a picture of my daughter, it instantly gets like between 70 and 120 likes. Like like within minutes. People love babies. L- likes babies. if you want likes, just be a cute baby. Don't babies. don't have any political opinions. It, no one cares about what you think about, you know, how compassionate you are, how successful you are. It doesn't matter. If you're a baby, People like you more than anybody else. Babies. That's the lesson I've learned. Stupid. And speaking of that, you know, last week we had a, a fun Vox box from Lance Taylor. Who? No, it, no, no. We, we have another one today. Well, we're gonna we're gonna do it later. But but you know, Lance uh, basically you bolted out. You didn't you didn't even hear this. Uh, Lance uh, t- warned me that I'm going to be watching a lot of uh, Mickey's Clubhouse, uh, which I insist will not happen because I said my daughter will watch Warner Brothers cartoons. I will not allow her to even know that things like Mickey Mouse Clubhouse exist. And, and by the way, the, the, and, the, the, the reason I left during that conversation is because Lance has a kid. Yeah. You have a kid. Yeah. Me? Can't get a date. <laughs> so really, I had nothing to contribute to that there conversation. Well, anyway, um, and Lance always very active on the Facebook page. Get he with is. it, people. Get with it. Uh, the, uh, it got me thinking, you know what? We've got a bunch of kid stuff. I haven't talked about what I will and will not let my daughter watch. So I brought the kid vid again this week. Oh, great. Here Hang on. That means I can go and have a drink. Okay, go. <laughs> Okay, See you, folks. Uh, you know Warner Brothers. Here's what my wife will. Uh, here's what my wife will allow our, me to let our daughter watch. I'll, I'll put it that way. I, it's it's really my wife's call. But uh, Looney Tunes, Mouse Chronicles, the Chuck Jones collection. This is awesome. This is a Blu-ray. Came out a little while ago, but uh, Warner Brothers was kind enough to send it to us. Nineteen remastered theatrical shorts uh, that are just outrageously, spectacularly, wonderfully funny. Now you have to understand that uh, a lot of these, you know, are basically a, a takeoff of the honeymooners and uh other than that it's just a lot of fun it's all all v- v- stuff from the warner brothers vault uh dealing with mice in cartoons it's just hysterical uh mouse wreckers the aristocat uh naughty but mice it's really really great and uh chuck jones was brilliant with mice and he somehow makes rodents cute i don't know whether it's a rabbit whether it's mice whatever it is he just that's that's his strong suit 
And then, more importantly, the uh, last year, we didn't get around to it then, but they were kind enough again to get it to us now, the Looney Tunes Platinum Collection Volume 2 on Blu-ray. This should be a must-own for everyone, everyone, whether you have kids, whether you have adults, whether you have uh, elderly parents, everyone will enjoy this. Eight more hours of just fantastic Warner Brothers uh, just legacy. Um, you know, it's amazing when you watch these two because you realize it's not all just Chuck Jones. Uh, some of the greatest animators in history all started at Warner Brothers and then, of course, fanned out elsewhere. Uh, notably, Tex Avery, the creator of uh, of uh, Droopy, and and many, many others. Uh, Leon Schlesinger. It, they, this is just uh, fantastic stuff. So you really, really want to uh, make sure that you get this because it never ends how much fun this is. Um the uh, the if you don't have the first volume either, you definitely want to pick that up. So that is the fantastic, amazing, wonderful Looney Tunes Platinum Collection Volume Two, which my daughter will be watching within the next forty eight hours. Even though she won't remember it, we'll get her onto it. And then real quickly, so that uh, Mark actually decides to come back in the room, uh, the uh, I'm going to blow through the rest of this as quickly as I can. The High Fructose Adventures of Annoying Orange, Volume 1, Escape from the Kitchen. This has been on Cartoon Network. I have absolutely no idea why uh, anyone watches this. The, the Annoying Orange is indeed incredibly annoying. The whole thing is just using that v- digital technology that puts... Uh, the, uh, the, the eyes and the, and the, the mouth of uh, human beings onto fruit, and uh, somehow that's supposed to substitute for comedy. It is annoying. Indeed, it is true to its title. Uh, Lego, this whole Lego promotional thing has really got to stop. There, I don't know why this is ages six and up. I don't know what's improper for anything below six on this. This is the uh, Lego version of Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Out, and it comes with a little kind of Lego Darth Vader toy in it. This is also a Cartoon Network thing, and it's just it's just a shameless attempt to uh, cross promote with Lego and to somehow I don't know get some traction uh, on on you know what Hasbro has been doing because Lego wants to be like the new Hasbro. I guess it's just terrible. Um, Moomin and Midsummer Madness. Uh, you know, this is uh, something that went right past me as well. This is apparently based on the Moomin Summer Madness book, uh, which is apparently some kind of a thing with kids and with families. I guess I'm going to be exposed to all of this. Uh, very kind of unusual animation from Finland that doesn't quite uh, make sense to me. But, uh, you know, they're they're like animal things, and they're, they're kind of animated and puppety, and they freak me out a little bit. So uh, something's going on in Finland. I don't know if it's the water or something that they're drinking. Mark, how you doing over there? Mark? Hi. Fine, good. All right. Uh, Sesame Street, Best of Friends. This is uh, just all kinds of, uh, this is kind of a potpourri of, uh, you know, learning stuff with Bert and Ernie and Cookie Monster and Grover. And uh, it's, it's just supposed to kind of foster friendship. I, I don't, I don't, it made me kind of want to kill Grover, frankly. I'm, I'm kind of over Grover. You know that, Mark? I'm over Grover. Just saying, I'm over Grover. But do you want to snuggle with? No. Not at all. Snooky. Not at all. Uh, Max's Chocolate Chicken. This is from Scholastic Storybook Treasures. And you know what? My daughter will watch this. She will. This is, uh, this is great. The, 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 uh, the Springtime Collection featuring Max's Chocolate Chicken uh, along with the Red Hen and Chicken Little, which is really good. These are all really good stories. Very nicely animated. Terrific animation, including uh, you know Lily Tomlin and Randy Travis. Really good stuff. Uh, educational. Classy. Doesn't overstimulate with, you know, the, the rapid-fire television editing, which I hear is bad for ADD. You know that. What? R- what? Rapid-fire television editing, rapid-fire television, like MTV, bad for ADD. Creates ADD. We are children. We are the children of MTV. Yes, we are. A couple of weird kind of adulty animated things that uh, I may show my daughter when she's a little bit older. One is Tatsumi uh, by Eric Koo, which is very uh, anime-influenced. Um, he is a Japanese artist, so but but it's not exactly anime per se. So um, y- you want to kind of separate this out a little bit. It's uh, y- you know uh, y- Yoshi. Oh, I'm, I'm gonna do my best to do his name. Yoshihiro Tatsumi. Am I okay? Is that good? Yeah, Yoshihiro Tatsumi. He he's a manga uh, guy, but um, you know it's it, somehow the animation is not. It, it's like it's like a step 
away from traditional anime. The characters don't quite look like they do in anime. They're it's just a, it's a little bit different. So I don't know if I, I should call this traditional anime or not. Anyway, um, and the the director of this Eric Koo is Singaporean. So you know there's a there's kind of a pan Asian thing going on. So it's not pure. Japanese animation, but it's lovely, actually. It's uh, it, it's just, you know, kind of fantastic, whimsical children's tales, a little bit on the more mature side, so I'm going to wait until she's maybe, you know, 16 or 17 to let her see that. Aloyas Nebel by Tomas Lunak is uh, really cool. This was uh, this is Czech animation, proud history of animation in Czechoslovakia, although it's mostly stop motion. And this is not. This was uh, actually the Czech submission for the 84th Academy Awards, and it did not get it. But it is uh, it is a fine, fine film, and it is really it's almost it's more of the uh, what's the uh, what's the thing that they use for uh, that that uh, the you know the it's not animation, but it's like the that that uh, you know rotoscope no, yeah, yeah, the, the rotoscoping thing, right? Yeah, like that Richard Linklater does. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is, right? Rotoscoping. That's primarily what this is. So it's kind of partly rotoscoped. Uh, like Waking Life, right? That yeah, was that was sure. the thing. Yeah, yep. this is this is partly rotoscoped, but there it seems to be a little bit animated as well. So it's somewhere it's it's in that realm, and uh, it's cool. It's uh, it's black and white. It's a noir. It's uh, it's very kind of uh, German expressionist, and uh, the whole thing takes place during the uh, the end of the Cold War over on the Czech Slovak border. It's really cool. It's very very cool. Apparently based on a comic book trilogy uh, that was uh, kind of a big deal graphic novel at the time back in the late nineties. Uh, you know, kind of addressing Czech history with uh, you know aggressive animation, a little bit like Ari Folman's deal, the uh, the Israeli film. There's a little bit of that too. Oh, the um, not the uh, not the gatekeepers. The um, yeah, the, the, the uh, yeah. hang on, keep going. Yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, by the way, speaking of while you're tra- while we're trying to remember Ari Folman's film that was uh, Oscar nominated. Um, Ari Folman is uh, just got a spot at Cannes. I think it's the is it the closing? Did they give him closing night? Oh no, it's opening. Waltz with Bashir. No, yes, Waltz with Bashir. His his new film, which is also partly animated, is going to be opening the director's fortnight in a few weeks at Cannes. Really? Yeah, nice, right? Uh, blowing through the rest of this real quickly, we've got uh, PBS Kids Submarine Adventures. Uh, PBS Kids is great. Uh, that's also, I will let my daughter watch PBS Kids stuff. This is good um, because it's educational. It's uh, you know she'll have to be a little bit older to fully understand all of this uh, kind of stuff dealing with you know uh, the, the dinosaurs, underwater dinosaurs, and uh, you know and reptiles and how they evolved and all that kind of stuff. It's not not overly heavy, but it's fun. And then we've got uh, Howdy Kids, a Saturday afternoon Western Roundup. This, uh, this my daughter will also watch, uh, even though it's not really so much for girls except for uh, the Annie Oakley stuff. Uh, it's all that kind of, you know, kid Western stuff that I grew up with, and a lot of it even heavily predating me. Most of it predating me is Cisco Kid and Sergeant Preston of the Yukon, the Roy Rogers Show, and uh, Lone Ranger and the Rifleman. But, you know, uh, I, I love this stuff. You, you, watched the, you watched the Lone Ranger growing up? I did. Actually, I did. Yeah, it was great, right? Jay Silverheels. You know, I was uh, one. What did I know? That movie's going to suck. You yeah, know that. No. Oh, it's my just... gosh. I, and by the way, I, I, I defend Gore Verbinski. I like Gore Verbinski. I, look, I look, like his films. You, you've I seen think the he's new, a great stylist. You've he seen is. the new trailer, right? You've seen the new trailer? Uh, no. The new trailer is oh, ter- I did. The Didn't new I? trailer is absolutely terrific. It is terrific. There's I mean, a train. And it almost train. changed my, my entire opinion of the film. I mean, it has that whole the, the mythical story of how he became the Lone Ranger, all the stuff that I love. And I'm like, you know what? This is looking pretty damn good. Suddenly, I may be on board. Maybe they actually are going to pull this off. And then suddenly, Johnny Depp shows up with a with a bird on his head, and he goes, "You look um like you need big heap um help." And I thought, "Oh crap!" It just went right down the toilet. And then, as if that weren't bad enough, the next shot is Helena Bonham Carter as some kind of a whore going, and I'm like, "Oh, we're into Tim Burton territory." The, the, you uh, know, heaven the, help us. The problem is that between between all the Tim Burton stuff he does and all the Gore Verbinski stuff he does, you know, Johnny Ugh. Depp has not really no. given. A, a human performance in, in many years. A long years. time. A long time. And he time. started out doing nothing with that kind of stuff. I know. Uh, regular show Party Pack. This is also from uh, Cartoon Network. This is just 16 episodes of this very, very disturbing show that's not terribly well animated, but it's got a, it, you know what? Look, it's got a, it's got a following. People like regular show. You'll have to email me and explain it to me. My daughter will not watch this. Uh, Turtles Tale 2, Sammy's Escape from Paradise. You know what's funny about this? The, the, they actually got a sequel out of this. You probably never heard of this because it's a lowbrow animation. And uh, they it, basically, it's it's a French animation company that made a film called Sammy's Tale or A Turtle's Tale, 
uh, all about this little turtle named Sammy, and uh, it, it was like a, a an attempt to sort of knock off something in the neighborhood of Finding Nemo that also felt a little bit like Happy Feet. Anyway, uh, well, this is this is uh, you know Turtles Tale Two: Sammy's Escape from Paradise. It's the sequel, and it's kind of it's sort of more of the same. And then Thomas and Friends. I'm not sold on my daughter watching Thomas and Friends either. Uh, this is Go Go Thomas and uh, Railway Mischief. The you know he's he's a badly CGI'd uh, train, and the latter one, Railway Mischief, is an exclusive at Walmart. I don't know that it matters. I uh, I. I these things are for really small children who just don't understand that uh, trains are dangerous. And uh, little kids could watch this and think that it's fun and walk across the train tracks and say, Hi, Thomas, come to me, and then they'll get run over. And I don't think that's uh, in the interest of safety. But that being said, uh, a lot of kids love this stuff. I have friends whose kids just cannot get enough Thomas, and uh, they love it when I get these Thomas DVDs because it means that they get to in- indulge their kids with Thomas. And I just say, here, knock yourselves out, uh, give, them, give them all the Thomas they need, and uh, go get yourself some lunch. Porky and Friends is uh, also a Looney Tunes release from Warner Brothers. Hilarious Ham, 18 classic Porky Pig cartoons. Um, just there's not a bad one in the in the bunch here. Not one bad one. Uh, Corn on the cop, boobs in the woods, curtain razor, pest that came to dinner, gone batty, bunny and Claude. Oh, bunny and Claude, so great. The great carrot train robbery, all just wonderful stuff. Porky Pig made stuttering cool. And uh, if you have been collecting slowly the uh, Looney Tunes superstars titles, you'll love that one. And then there's also play with Barney. Uh, I'm not even going to. I'm not even going to take advantage of the joke that that makes so obvious. Um, but this has on Barney on the cover with a big baseball cap and holding a baseball bat. It is deeply disturbing, and uh, there's nothing about Barney that I, I have much appreciation for. Uh, it, it creeps me out. It really does. It's like kids will watch this and they'll see a dinosaur and they'll think, "Oh, dinosaurs are cute." And then when they see a dinosaur, they'll go, "Come to me, big dinosaur," and they get eaten. And that uh, that's not good either. And then lastly. Uh, we have the Wild Kratts Rainforest Rescue from PBS Kids. Uh, you know what? This is actually uh, not bad. It's not top tier uh, PBS Kids. Animation isn't top tier. The stories aren't quite top tier, but it's it's all right. Uh, you know, it's, it's more educational than most of the stuff. And then uh, lastly, Cars Life Three, which I had never even heard of. Cars Life One and Two. This is obviously a knockoff of uh, Cars. The, uh, the Pixar series, and uh, it, the animation is really substandard, but uh, on some level, this is better than Cars 2. You know that? Well, Cars 2 was so... Uh, Cars 2 sort of broke Pixar's uh, winning streak. It was oh, so mercenary. Terrible. All that product placement and just... Uh, it's terrible. Terrible. And then we got, uh, real quickly, just to uh, segue over to some anime. My daughter will not watch anime, but I will watch some anime. Uh, this is from uh, Viz who is a great company, Viz and uh, Funimation uh, do most of the anime stuff these days, Nora, Rise of the Yokai Clan. Uh, this is really cool. Um, you know, anything that deals with samurai culture on anime, I'm all over it. And then Tiger and Bunny. Um, you know, this is kind of weird. I, I, I had never heard of Tiger and Bunny, and uh, it's a little bit like... Um, it's a, it's a little, it's, it's a, you know, it's kind of a dystopian uh, metropolis thing. Uh, I don't know. It, it, it feels, it feels like it should have been in 1982, maybe, but um, I don't know. It's, it's, it, it's, you know, not my, not my style of anime. And then uh, Inuyasha, the movie, the complete collection. Uh, these things are just dynamic, beautifully animated, really cool, make no sense whatsoever. This is on Blu-ray, very, very slick, uh, very nicely transferred on Blu-ray. Uh, Shonen Jump Bleach, uh, episodes 230 to 242. I have not watched this entire series. Uh, this is, uh, you know, a, a long-running, very popular uh, anime series that uh, deals with all kinds of uh, samurai politics and intrigue. And uh, if you haven't watched it all the way through, you're probably going to be lost, but it's still cool animation and well worth watching. And then lastly, Pokemon does not stop. You thought Pokemon had gone away? Nope. This is Pokemon the movie, Kyurem, the Sword of Justice. I'm not a Pokemon fan. Not sure that my daughter will ever watch Pokemon because she'll want the cards if they still have those. They still have those cards? No, but you know who died? Who died? Because I can't, I can't talk about this anymore. Hmm. Uh, ne- uh, Al Newharth. The, uh, who that? Al Newharth is the, uh, the guy who uh, started USA Today. Oh, no kidding. Really? You know, you know, like in USA Today, they've been using the same 
photo of Al Newharth in their op-ed page for like 30 years. By the way, I have the very first issue of a USA Today. Unfortunately, it's in pretty bad shape. It's like it's like it's like folded in half in, in a drawer somewhere. But I do I, I did buy the very first issue of USA Today because I thought someday it'll be worth something. Of course, what I didn't think is someday it'll be worth something if I took care of it. Uh-oh. That part uh, I, I slipped on that part. But uh, otherwise, it's uh, rolled into a half uh, in some drawer somewhere. Anyway, Al Newharth, the right. uh, guy who started USA Today, uh, died uh, a couple weeks ago. All yes, right. Mark, we're we're we're, we're into new movies now. Oh, oh, what? Yes. I wow. Know, I know. Kid stuff done. Kid vid done. God damn. I just sit here waiting for you to stop with this. Crap. I know. Um, Wade, let me tell you something. Yes. If you go to RottenTomatoes.com, you will see that Silver Linings Playbook has a 92%. Does it really? It does. Seriously? One of the only negative reviews of Silver Linings Playbook <laughs> is you. Is <laughs> now, the funny thing is that I actually rewatched it, and I liked it more a- 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 after I rewatched it. I have to say, I think my initial problem with it was... And I, I did, too. I wasn't that keen on it the first time, but I, the second time, I just cried. I it was wonderful. It, it was better the second time. There's no doubt about it. But my, my issue is uh, manyfold. One is Bradley Cooper. I think that Bradley Cooper was not deserving of an Oscar nomination. I think that this, his performance was just a bunch of ticks and chattering and yelling and random screaming that had absolutely no basis in any sort of neurological disorder ever. He just sort of like screamed and yelled and, and hit his mom and whatever. It just seemed like a bunch of nothing. And Jennifer Lawrence is, of course, the greatest thing since sliced bread. It's amazing. And she's amazing. She's great, and she's always great, and I love her, and she's great. Uh, that I kind of understand. But um, and I, what I didn't like also is the uh, is the completely conventional third act where you've got not only do you have the will they win the big dance contest, uh, you know, plot thread which is bad enough or will they get over a five whatever with the score they had to get on the yeah game. that's bad enough but there's also the double bet where robert de niro might be able to fund his cheesesteak restaurant i mean are you kidding yeah. me that's the best picture stop that <laughs> you know so i i feel like it's a typical romantic comedy in the clothing of something that's deeper and more no that's true but, and but it's just it, not it, probably true but it's awfully fun to watch if you if you really kind of let yourself go it's very old-fashioned i quite enjoyed it I mean, uh, I, the message of the film is that if you're if you're bipolar and if you have mental illness, you really need to just stick with your own. Yeah, yeah, Don't try to date normal people. Just date someone else who's mentally ill and have mentally ill children and, and contaminate the earth. And, and also, which our good friend Ray Green had mentioned in an email to us the other day, he's like, this film is almost dangerous because it assumes <laughs> that love conquers all illnesses. <laughs> you know, like basically at the end they kiss and you just assume they're fine and live happily ever after. Yeah. Well, you know what? They're still screwed up people. <laughs> you know, they're not cured. Yeah, probably true. Uh, Not Fade Away was a film that was, for a moment, considered to possibly have some award chances last year, and then the initial buzz on it was so poor that Paramount just kind of yanked all its support and allowed it to dwindle into non-existence. Uh, David Chase, who is a big deal, uh, was a big wig on television, kind of still is, right? David, David Chase? Chase, yeah. He created The Sopranos. Um, well, David Chase wrote and directed this, and it's very semi-autobiographical. Um, you know, it's it's about in the, set in the 1960s, and about you know we're gonna we're gonna have make make, make a band, we're gonna become famous, and it's it's about a bunch of kids that you know form a band, and you know how that uh, how that sort of pans out for them, frankly, trying to you know make it big in the music business at a time when there actually was still a music business. I it, the thing is, the movie just kind of meanders. It's extremely well intentioned. What are you tapping away at, like a mani- maniac over there? Wait, I'm trying to do the best job I can for our fans. Oh, okay. What are you doing? You're doing nothing. All right. Jesus. Anyway. This uh, guy, he thinks he's all that. He's not all that. Produced by Mark Johnson, by the way. Mark, Mark- Johnson, too. Guy's a jerk. <laughs> Anyway, produced by Mark Johnson, who, of course, is, you know, produced Rain Man and uh, the Chronicles of Narnia films. And Mark Johnson, who is uh, right still for many years, has been the chair of the Foreign Language Committee at the Academy and, uh, and really has done a great job sort of trying to get to rein that uh, award into, sh- you know, kind of bring it under control and get rid of some of these strange rules conundrums that have caused the, uh, the category to sort of be of suspect um, – uh, of suspect Quality, integ- integrity, integrity, I should say, of suspect Ooh, integrity. So anyway, good word. Yeah, Mark Johnson, You're good guy. Smart. Uh, so I respect the film in the sense that it's well intentioned and it's got it's deeply rooted in David Chase's childhood and his teenage years, and you know that Mark Johnson's a good producer and they really put this thing together with a lot of love and a real you know sense of nostalgia. But that being said, it just it it kind of meanders and it just lies there and it never really feels. 
it never really takes flight emotionally, and it's unfortunate because I think that's a script problem. I think they could have, you know, the cast is decent, and and you know, a lot of the dialogue is fine, but it just never really takes flight, and that's unfortunate. But um, if you're a David Chase fan, you know James Gandolfini's in this as well. He's the uh, he's the dad, the dad that doesn't want his kid being long haired hippie rock and roll. The you know traditional 50s dad who's just sees the sees his world slipping away um trying to take out his failed dreams on everybody else anyway it's on blu-ray and uh it's got its moments it's got a couple of couple of moments in it so it might be worth a rent i would say maybe worth a rent i'm not going to completely dismiss it uh, wait, one film I will dismiss, however, with Mother's Day coming up. Um, oh, geez, when is Mother's uh, Day? We've uh, got to celebrate that finally. It's, uh, that's true, not a moment too soon. Um, that's like in a few weeks, isn't it? Yes, it yeah, is. Damn. So Mother's Day may wind up with a bunch of um, mothers and their kids watching The Guilt Trip with uh, Barbara Streisand and Seth Rogen. And, you know, Barbara Streisand, except for a couple of Fockers films, she doesn't really do that much anymore. So the fact that she was she's, wanted... she's going to direct again, though, dude. That's great. Isn't that great? Yep. That's awesome. And uh, this movie was directed by uh, Anne Fletcher, who uh, has directed nothing but terrible movies. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, she probably uh, always will. Because, you know, uh, there's a thing that she does where she uh, directs bad movies and stuff like The Proposal, which is terrible, and Step Up, which I didn't like either. So, now just go trip. Okay. I'm not even... I don't want to know where that came from. It's actually a Family Guy riff. Oh. You Family Guy fans, gods at digigods.com. Yeah, Family Guy... Anyway, um, this uh, is a lamentable reason to bring Barbara Streisand back to the movies, and uh, it's very uh, crude, which the older people won't enjoy, and it's got Barbara Streisand, who the younger people don't care about, and uh, it's just totally not even remotely, you know, it's all based on cliched opinions of, you know, young, old, mostly Jewish behavior, and, uh, you know, they're fine, they're game, but ultimately this thing is not grounded in any reality. And it's all kvetching, and it's all contrived, and uh, I just was not a fan of this movie, and I think that when you're going to put those two together, you got to get somebody better uh, than Dan Fogman writing it, you got to get somebody more interesting than Ann Fletcher directing it, and ultimately this thing is just a total blah time at the movies. Guilt Trip. Mark, did the details get a theatrical release? The details? Do you remember, do, do you, do you remember if this got a theatrical release or I not? I do not. Do you remember? I don't think it did. Because it's, um, it's an Anchor Bay release of a... Uh, a, a Weinstein Radius film, and I, this I, I don't remember this getting a theatrical release. And I'm looking at it, and I'm thinking, okay, it's pretty funny, it's wacky, it's it's eccentric, hard to market. And you look at the cast, and you think, but still, with a hard to market plot, you should have been able to at least. I mean, when you've got Tobey Maguire, Elizabeth Banks, Ray Liotta, Laura Linney, Kerry Washington, Dennis Haysbert, you got to be able to do something with that cast, right? That belongs well, in movies. Well, maybe the movie sucks. It doesn't. It's it's. I mean, look here. Basically, the the idea here is that Tobey Maguire and uh, Elizabeth Banks are a couple whose marriage is, you know, it's got problems, and uh, that segues into uh, they live out in the boot, you know, in the boonies, and and raccoons are causing all kinds of problems. So he develops a Bill Murray like obsession with eradicating the raccoons, like Murray with the gopher and Caddyshack. I mean, it really is. It's 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 patented on that, modeled on that completely, and uh, it, it from there it just gets progressively more and more ridiculous. It is a fun, absurdist, kind of wacky movie, and uh, I don't know why this didn't get any kind of attention. I mean, it should. This should have. This is the kind of movie in the mid '80s. This would have done fifteen, twenty million dollars, no problem. What, why why are we losing the the middle the mid level studio film? It just this should have been. This should have been like a like make this instead of an Adam Sandler movie. Somebody, please release it. Put it in theaters. More people will see it. Well, the only studio doing stuff like that anymore is Sony, Disney, Paramount. True. They're all they're all tent poles and, you, and, and superheroes. And and that's exactly what just went down at CinemaCon. By the way, everybody was like, you know, all the other studios are just they're just only making tent poles and fewer and fewer movies, and they're re- resigned to you know movies be- <coughs> kind of. The fact that they they can't make anything that's less than $200 million except for Sony. Sony had this two-and-a-half-hour presentation, said we're working on multiple levels, lots of different movies, we believe in movies, and exhibitors loved it because it basically said we have faith in the people that you have faith in. Everybody else is just kind of backing out out of movies. It's just weird. It's like the studios have just given up. It's so strange. I don't get it. Movie schmovies. I don't get it. 
Anyway, and then uh, also Late Bloomers is uh, a film by Julie Gavras, who is Costa Gavras' daughter, who is a very talented filmmaker in her own right. Um, I was just on the radio uh, last week kind of moaning about uh, Brandon Cronenberg being a, an imitation of his dad with his directing debut, Antiviral, which we will be talking about on this show, I'm sure, in about two or three months. Um, anyway, this is, uh, this is a, a lovely, lovely uh, romantic comedy, which I, I never would have imagined from anybody with the name Gavras. But Julie Gavras is a lovely, lovely romantic comedy with William Hurt and Isabella Rossellini. Uh, and uh, even if you feel like, well, Isabella Rossellini, William Hurt, that sounds like a movie from the 80s, fine, even better. Uh, just a lovely film, beautifully directed, very, very nicely put together in every conceivable way, beautifully shot in particular, and uh, great supporting performances from Joanna Lumley. Yes, Abfab. Love Joanna Lumley when she shows up in a non-Abfab film, as well as Simon Callow, who is just always a delight. So uh, this is on Blu-ray, uh, and if this is from all of films. You've got to check it out. It was released in 2011, and it um, never made it to American screens, never made it to uh, DVD or Blu-ray prior to, until now. Finally, all of films god bless you for bringing this movie out it's a really good film deserves to be there blu-ray check it out uh wade uh django unchained is out this week and um i was uh kind of like silver linings playbook i was not a huge fan of this movie i felt that it had a great first 45 minutes a rip roaring last hour was hilarious that middle hour was just death I, I I would say the first hour is great. Second hour is horrendous. Last uh, you know twenty thirty minutes, whatever it is, uh, it, uh, pretty good. So we're we're kind of in the ballpark. I think we draw our our lines maybe in a few different places. Honestly, once the, this movie it feels epic for that first hour, and then once they lock themselves in a mansion with uh, DiCaprio, with DiCaprio, all the, all the DiCaprio stuff, no fault oh. of DiCaprio, but all the DiCaprio stuff, <sighs> the movie just dies. It just falls off a cliff. It just go. It just crawls up into a fetal position and is just dead as a doorknob. I just think that sometimes uh, Tarantino is justifiable in, yeah. in loving his dialogue and wanting to hear as much of it as possible, and he, yeah. he buys it in bulk. But sometimes, you know what? You do want to have an editor, yeah, telling you that this is just too long, yeah. And I just, but again, we're sort of in the minority on this because I, everybody loved it and it won two Oscars. I am completely happy that Christoph Waltz won again. I don't care if he wins six Oscars for the next six Tarantino films. He's great. Love him. He's fantastic. Done. I think that the Tarantino win for best original screenplay at the Oscars was uh, a huge surprise. I don't think anybody expected that. I don't know whether they gave it to him because he wrote so much dialogue. Maybe they, Maybe it was like a volume thing. But um, ultimately, I don't know that he deserved that, you know, at all. So, yeah, so uh, Django and Chain, I think Wade and I are a bit on the minority uh, about this one. Um, so there you go. I'm not, we're, no, we're not telling you what it's about because we assume you already know. Yeah, everyone and knows. And we assume you're probably saying those digigods, they're just, they just don't get it. No. That said, I love Tarantino. I think he's great. Didn't deserve uh, the screenplay award. It did not. He's I, got I, two Academy Awards now for screenwriting. That's just bizarre. <laughs> Uh, Quentin. Anyway. So anyway, so Jamie Foxx, Christoph Waltz, uh, DiCaprio, Kerry Washington, Samuel Jackson. Uh, there's a lot of funny stuff in it. And, you know, I just ultimately, I don't, I don't really know. It's funny because I, I, I don't, Tarantino has been threatening to do a Django film for years. Mm-hmm. Yet this film has nothing to do with like Django. No, not the at all. The actual you know, no. Italian film no. from the 70s that he loves so much. Even though Franco Nero shows up in the film with a cameo and that cute little uh, bit where he's like, a D is silent, you know, when nobody other than diehard Django movie fans know that. No, this actually riffs, it's not a Django riff, it riffs on a whole series of films uh, that use the now very, very taboo N-word, which Tarantino has no problem with, that, but that had that in the title, you know, like uh, like N. Charlie and Boss N. You know, those those movies, Fred Williamson, when they uh, released uh, Boss N as just Boss on DVD, it had a whole thing, a little little uh, uh, disclaimer from him saying, I did not approve this change in the title. I would prefer they release it with the original title. That's the movie that we made. And, of course, when you watch the movie, well, it, that, that's the name of the movie on the DVD. Or on, it, it, They didn't change it on the actual film. They just changed it on the box. You know, and those are the movies that were all kind of about black empowerment through these revisionist westerns. And Tarantino was really riffing on those films more than anything uh, that's like a spaghetti western here. Uh, that's true, and I think ultimately, I don't. Uh, the The disconnect here is that you know it, it takes place in the South, obviously. Yeah. And you know the South is all about Southern you know gentility and not really saying what you mean and, right. and that kind of. But and so I don't know that that sensibility really matched up 
with the vomitous amounts of dialogue that Tarantino writes. No. You know, I think that that sort of fundamentally was an issue. But, you know, I'm breaking it down more than I think most viewers ever will. Yep. Um, I think that if somebody gave me a cut of this film that was, that was two hours and 15 minutes, I'd probably love it. I agree. Uh, it's in the blood. It's an interesting little independent horror film that's kind of like, you know, it's a father and son. Uh, well, it's a bit of an allegory. Father and son go on a, uh, a wilderness journey, right? Uh, but it, it, what looks like it might wind up being kind of deliverance winds up being a little bit more like a, a kind of a ghost movie version of The Hills Have Eyes. And it splits genres, and it kind of cuts across a lot of interesting, uh, interesting areas. But uh, I got to tell you, what really, really elevates this thing is Lance Henriksen. And Lance Henriksen became kind of a cheese ball in recent years, ever since you know he was really kind of a, a legit guy for a moment with uh, like the right stuff. Um, and then he went a little bit into the cheesy area and started doing kind of you know mid level straight to video stuff. But um, I gotta tell you, Lance Henriksen, man, he brings it in this movie. And even though the movie has problems and it's a horror film and it's a straight to video horror film, he he's just great. And uh, it, I don't know if I'd recommend somebody buying this, but if you do like horror films and if you like Lance Henriksen, uh, it's worth checking out. Definitely, I'd say as a rental, if not if nothing else. I'm a huge fan of uh, Andrea Arnold. I know you are. I do. Yeah. Uh, Red Road was great. Uh, Fish Tank was terrific. The tough one is Wuthering Heights, which is uh, her very, it's almost, um, what's his name, uh, Baz Luhrmann-esque. Oh, yeah, yeah, revision. Revisionist of, yeah. Uh, modernization of the Emily Bronte uh, classic It's novel. still a period film, though. It is a period film, yeah. but I do feel like it has it has. Very much uh, modern sensibilities. Yeah. Well, the, the interracial thing is... There's an interracial thing going on where there's the... Where the, the, uh, the Heathcliff Heath, is black. Heathcliff is black and whatnot. But uh, I still think this film comes out on top. I just think that uh, she's such a great stylist and she's reimagined it in such an interesting way. And even if, you know, you can argue that I guess she misunderstands maybe the soul of the material, but... It doesn't matter because I just feel like she found her way into it, and that's okay. It's also beautifully acted and very intense. It's really better than a lot of the TV adaptations of the material, and uh, I just I liked it a lot. I mean, obviously it's a bit off. I mean, not off putting just because you're used to seeing this material presented a certain way, and now that it's different, you have to kind of get over that hump. Well, you have but to once g- you get into it, you realize this is terrific. They, they should. I don't know that they should have called it Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights because it, because it's not really Emily Bronte. She's sort of uh, she's doing to this what Kubrick did to The Shining, which is she says you know what I realize that the book is one thing, the story is one thing. Emily Bronte told the story, but I think I can use this story and I can you know fold it into something a little bit different to tell a different different kind of a message, to convey a different sort of sensibility. So it probably should have just been uh, like Andrea Arnold's Wuthering Heights. Uh, but that being said, she's one of the great directors out of the UK in, I'd say, the last 20 years. And even though she hasn't yet hit it big here, uh, she's still really kind of an unknown. Um, I, I just feel like there's she's got a film in her in the next five or six years that will just really explode and just totally put her on the map, maybe even win an Oscar. I hope so. I think she's terrific. So, uh, Wuthering Heights. I would, if you're into Andrea Arnold, I'd probably start with. Um, I would start with uh, Red uh, Red Road first, and then I'll move on to Fish Tank because Wuthering Heights is a tough movie to start with if you're kind of getting into this terrific director. But uh, eventually, you should get around to um, Wuthering Heights by Andrea Arnold. Good stuff. Controversial stuff, revisionist stuff, but good Absolutely. stuff. Absolutely. Uh, we, we got a few things here that we're just going to knock through real quickly because a lot of this is kind of programmer stuff. Uh, Olive has steadily been releasing a lot of old John Wayne films from the Paramount Library, stuff that Paramount just does not. I mean, John Wayne made so many movies, and Paramount just does not have the uh, – the stomach to dig through all of it and release all of it individually. So uh, a handful of John Wayne Blu-rays here from Olive that are just uh, worth mentioning. Santa Fe Stampede by George Sherman is another one of the three Musketeer movies that Wayne made along with uh, Ray Corrigan and Max Terhune. Uh, That's Musketeers spelled like mesquite, M-E-S-Q-U-I-T-E-E-R-S. That was a cute little uh, series of programmers they made back in the late 30s and early 40s. Uh, This is just like all the rest of them. Nothing particularly uh, unique in that one. Uh, Wake of the Red Witch is John Wayne and Gail Russell doing, um, you know, one of those nautical adventure movies that kind of was part of... um, 
uh, you know, Wayne tried it in the late 40s to, even though he was becoming a really, really big star in westerns and other things, you know, a lot of it was um, trying to do the sort of thing that other actors were successful in doing, uh, whether it's, you know, uh, Errol Flynn or, um, you know, Tyrone Power. He wanted to sort of compete in the, in the same range as those guys, and not all of these quite work so well. Uh, this is one of them. Um, you might want to rent this. It's okay. Uh, it's you know, uh, Edward Ludwig is not the best director from the period, but it's all right. John Wayne in uh, War of the Wildcats is an Albert S. Rogel film. This is a yeah, another kind of a Western programmer, better than uh, most of the low effort uh, Western films he was making in the early '40s. You can kind of see how this propelled him into bigger and better things. And then, uh, of course, the all-time classic Edward Ludwig film, maybe the best film that Ludwig ever made, was The Fighting Seabees. John Wayne, when he's not in a Western, you want him definitely in a World War II film. And uh, this is one of the better ones. So this has some terrific uh, stuff in it. Um, and it's mostly because of Wayne. He just really he brings the heavy, he brings the macho, and it's a, it's a very, very nicely done Blu-ray. And... Rounding out our olive coverage, a uh, few other films: Myrna Loy and Robert Richam, uh, Robert Richam, Robert Mitchum in *The Red Pony*, uh, directed by Lewis Milestone, and uh, based on the John Steinbeck screenplay. Um, you know, uh, the, the 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 problem here is that it's based on a bunch of Steinbeck short stories, and they kind of I don't know that they fit together quite comfortably but it's very well intentioned the acting is good and milestone who of course did all quiet on the western front one of the first films to win uh, best picture uh is a, is just a, a real workmanlike director from that in that classic vein the real reason to watch this is for aaron copeland's score aaron copeland didn't write a lot of film scores but uh this is one of the best and it makes the movie feel a lot better than it has any business being uh, Champion, the uh, Kirk Douglas film directed by Mark Robson, featuring a screenplay by the uh, wonderful Carl Foreman, who of course was blacklisted and produced by Stanley Kramer. That is a heavy hitting team, and this has been on DVD for a long time. Paramount let Olive put it out onto Blu-ray. Thank goodness, because it's a it's one of Kirk Douglas's best performances. It's a great, great looking Blu-ray from 1949. Um, one of the best boxing movies you'll ever see. Not because it's directed like uh, Raging Bull or anything like that. It's better than Rocky, but it just features an incredible performance and a really, really good screenplay. It's um, it's about more than boxing, which any good sports film should be. Uh, and then lastly, uh, Groucho Marx in Copacabana. This is a, kind of a, a, a weird little uh, you know, novelty that has uh, hung around for a long time. You realize how badly Groucho needs the other Marx brothers because it just uh, he, he can't really sustain this film, even with Carmen Miranda wearing you know, an entire produce section on her, on her head and on her, her uh, costume. Um, Adolf, Alfred Green is not the, uh, the most efficient director in terms of uh, you know keeping it tight this is a very long kind of flabby 92 minute movie from 1947 but um, if you're a, a Groucho fan and you want to you know just explore the curiosity of Groucho trying to be funny without his brothers it's worth checking out I absolutely love Magic Town I think uh, James Stewart and Jane Wyman make for a just terrific on screen couple I think this is an intensely underrated movie uh, if Frank Capra had uh, you know made this it wouldn't be any better better. William Wellman directed this and uh, another great director of the of the period along with uh, Milestone already mentioned and uh, you know just see it for Jimmy Stewart man the guy's just one of the great all-time presences on screen beautiful blu-ray. And then lastly from Olive we have uh, John Auer's City That Never Sleeps which uh, is a film I had actually never seen before from 1953, one of the uh, great uh, noirs of the period, and it was nice to uh, rediscover uh, a noir that I'd never seen before, which is really, really, really good. And uh, it's, a, it's a sharp script, really sharp script. So um, definitely check out City That Never Sleeps if you are a noir fan. Mark? I'm a noir fan. Wait, uh, the good folks at uh, Mill Creek have released a couple of twofers, two films on uh, one Blu-ray. That usually means that one or both are terrible. Let's test that theory right now. <laughs> uh, the first one, they got a bunch. I'll roll through them real quick right, Wade, because uh, we need to get to the good stuff. Yep. So uh, we have the first one is a Hollywood Homicide and Hudson Hawk. Hollywood Homicide is uh, Harrison Ford and Josh, What Happened to Me, Hartnett. Starring this film about a uh, guy who does something stupid. Anyway, it's a stupid movie. And uh, Hudson Hawk, 
I'd actually rather watch Hudson Hawk than Hollywood Homicide. Um, Hudson Hawk is a uh, is a uh, legendary Bruce Willis uh, big budget bomb directed by Michael Lehman, kind of ruined his career. Uh, but I still think it's worth uh, it's worth kind of checking out Hudson Hawk. I think it's uh, it's you know what I think big budget bombs like Heaven's Gate and Ishtar are probably better. There's a you yeah. know, there's, there, there, there's a bigger spread there between their reputation and the actual f- quality of the film. Hudson Hawk, it's 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 good. It's fine. It's you know. Actually, I I would consider this with like Last Action Hero. Yeah. In terms of films that got beaten up but aren't that bad. Yeah. Whereas Ishtar and Heaven's Gate, I think are terrific. Actually, Heaven's Gate is Ishtar a is hysterical. You know. And have, I agree, Heaven's Gate's total masterpiece. Um, Hollywood Homicide is Harrison Ford at his just give me my twenty million, I'll do whatever you want, lamest. And there you go. Uh, the second two for uh, from Mill Creek is The Squid and the Whale and Running with Scissors. I'm a huge fan of The Squid and the Whale. I'm a huge fan of Noah Baumbach. I think Squid and the Whale uh, was pretty much the story of my parents' divorce. And uh, I just thought you always mention that. I just think the story's great. I love it. I love Squid and the Whale. Love Noah Baumbach. Love, love all of his films. Running with Scissors uh, was it was Ryan Murphy. Was a bit of a. Uh, it's got a great cast, but it's a bit of a kind of a misbegotten mess of characters and cross plots and whatnot. It's Annette Bening and uh, 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 what's his name, Alec Baldwin, the late Jill Clayburgh's in it. Gwyneth Paltrow. Not a big fan of Running with the Scissors based on the uh, novel, but there you go. Uh, also, we have Hollow Man 1 and Hollow Man 2. Now, Hollow Man 1... Oh, I hate that movie. ...was directed by Paul, Paul Verhoeven. Ver- Paul Ver- it's like Paul Verhoeven at his lowest. It, that was just a wretched film. I know. Kevin Bacon plays Hollow Man. However, it uh, did uh, well enough that uh, they made another one called Hollow Man 2, not directed by Paul Verhoeven, who, of course, had moved on. And this one stars uh, Peter Fascinelli and Christian Slater. This is not a very good film. Uh, if I had a choice between Hollow Man 1 or Hollow Man 2, I would rent something else. That's what I would do. <laughs> Uh, on the classic uh, side, we have Ship of Fools and Lilith. Now, Ship of Fools is a Stanley Kramer film, and uh, you know Stanley Kramer was a sort of a message filmmaker, and I feel like his movies are not really aging that well. But uh, this one, I kind of like. This is one of those sort of grand hotel films where you get like a bunch of people on a huge, like you get a bunch of people in an enclosed space. Yeah. Some of them are rich, some of them are poor, and they all kind of have to you know interact mm-hmm. under crisis. And that's what Ship of Fools is. Um, I think Stanley Kramer. Has kind of done better films, but I feel like Stanley well, Kramer is not really. Uh, it, look, the, the movie was up for like eight Academy Awards, including Best Picture. So, like, people loved it, but I just feel like uh, Stanley Kramer is not aging well. Lilith uh, is an older film, 1964, stars Warren Beatty and Gene Seberg, the uh, classic, um, you know, French New Wave uh, starlet. Uh, any early Warren Beatty film is a good one. Uh, Lilith maybe not his best, but still a terrific film. I was uh, going to say, if you want a good Stanley Kramer film, Champion, which I just talked about, the Kirk Douglas thing. Uh, yes, it's not a, it's not a quintessential Stanley Kramer message movie, but it's 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 damn good. And we'll save the uh, the worst for second to last. I coined a phrase uh, from Mill Creek, a two for featuring Steven Seagal, Attack Force, and Into the Sun. Now Steven Seagal has done so many movies. They wound up picking two that I, that just I just never. I'm sure these were, were released like in Malaysia, and that's it. And Attack Force is about Steven Seagal kicking ass, and Into the Sun is also about Steven Seagal kicking ass. They have a lot in common, these two films. Yeah. They're really, really good. Anyway. Okay. Finally, from Mill Creek, the final twofer, When a Stranger Calls and Happy Birthday to Me. This is like Mill Creek saying, we bought the rights to these movies for about $50, mm-hmm. and we're going to uh, crank these out and hope that somebody's dumb enough to rent them. When a Stranger Calls stars Charles Durning, the late Charles Durning, as uh, somebody who nobody cares about, and Happy Birthday to Me stars Glenn Ford and Melissa Sue Anderson as uh, two people who nobody care about. Goodbye. Totally. All See right. how I do it versus how you do you it. You rock on, man. And I just say it sucks and I move on. You're being fair to every movie, and that's I'm bad. Tr- I know. Well, real quickly then also, Volume 6 of Forbidden Hollywood from the Warner Archive Collection. Uh, I, I love like these. these. I love these. These are great. These are all pre-code films. Uh, you know, there was that pre-code period in the early 30s. Uh, Between when the production code was actually approved and when yeah. it actually was enforced. Yeah, and, it, and it's pretty much from about 1927 to, what, like 1933, something like that. Well, 27 was the production code, but I think wasn't the pre-code, wasn't that 31 or 34? Let me, uh, I don't know. Well, anyway, it's it is this is it, they're all kind of in the yeah it's about thirty one to thirty four anyway that's where these films are from there are four films on this uh, volume six and uh, they're all worth watching um, 
obviously not great films all, but it's just interesting to see what was cons- what you could get away with during that period before the production code. You know, you watch old movies, you expect there to be a certain uh, protocol, a certain restriction, a certain restraint. And when you realize, you know, granted, this this is not, you know, this is like PG-13 at best by today's standards, but yet, according to what we would expect from these movies, you go, wow, that's kind of risque for back then. Really? Wow, did somebody just say that? Did they just do that? And uh, one of them is Mandalay with uh, Ricardo Cortez and uh, Warner Oland. Um, really kind of a, an, an interesting film that was uh, originally designed as a Kay Francis vehicle. Kay Francis was a uh, major actress of the day whose career lasted like 18 seconds. Uh, Massacre uh, with R- Richard Bartholomus is really only distinguished by some of its uh, political incorrectness as far as Native Americans are concerned. Uh, then you got Downstairs with John Gilbert, who was a major star of the day. And I would say the one that is most interesting by far is uh, Victor Fleming, the director, of course, of Gone with the Wind and uh, Wizard of Oz, did The Wet Parade. It is not at all what you would expect of a Victor Fleming film, and it's got a great cast, and it's a lot of fun. Cast includes Jimmy Durante and Walter Houston, uh, among others. It is a, that, is a, that is a film that is just, you'll, you'll be... You'll really kind of be shocked at what they get away with in the wet parade. The title alone should tell you everything. And uh, just know this. Wet parade was written by Upton Sinclair. I'm just saying. I'm just going to go there and just say Upton Sinclair. Upton Sinclair, he, 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 he likes um, adjectives and nouns. Yes, he Asphalt does. Asphalt jungle. Yeah. I mean, the uh, yeah, asphalt jungle. Yeah. Asphalt jungle, wet parade. Yeah. He likes that stuff. Yeah. You know, Wade, uh, when I was growing up, uh, I think you might have talked about this uh, a couple months ago. All my friends loved Cheech and Chong. I don't. And I was like, I was young and didn't get it and was incredibly not cool and just sat there and watched Star Trek all day long and didn't know about pot and being cool and low riders and whatever. <laughs> and uh, so I was totally just like a, a, just a, a lame little nerd in the making. And uh, that brings me to Cheech and Chong's animated movie. Now, Cheech and Chong's animated movie, it's, you know, Cheech and Chong had a big run, had a pretty significant run in, uh, like, you know, like in the 80s, whatever. Yeah. Now, this is new stuff, mm-hmm. but still, it's Cheech and Chong. Yeah. And uh, if you like that kind of stuff or you want to relive your teen years as an 80s pothead, you go ahead and rent Cheech and Chong's animated movie. There's a, a commentary by Cheech and Chong. There's also another commentary, including one by Lou Adler which is uh, kind of fun, kind of interesting. Uh, there's another commentary by Tommy Chong and Paris Chong. And uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a feature called Medical Marijuana Blues, which is kind of cute. Um, but still, I mean, what are you going to say? It's, uh, there's you know, nuns who uh, scream and yell, and there's the cops who are lame, and there's Cheech and Chong who smoke and are awesome, and that's just kind of what Cheech and Chong are. So there you go, Cheech and Chong's animated movie. Yeah. You know, uh, Major Dundee is one of those uh, forgotten Sam Peckinpah films that is really worth rediscovering. And uh, thanks to the incredible people at Twilight Time, it is resurrected. Now, here's the bad news. Twilight Time does limited releases, so there are only 3,000 of these available. And once those 3,000 are gone, they are gone. And you'll have to hope that somebody uh, sells theirs on eBay or something. Uh, this is a fabulous Blu-ray, beautiful transfer of uh, Major Dundee, the Sam Peckinpah film from 1965, only available at ScreenArchives.com. That's ScreenArchives, plural, dot com. And uh, the Major Dundee is, a, is really a fantastic film. I, I almost think it's one of Peckinpah's best. Uh, Charlton Heston in his in that mode where he's just shifting from uh, his Ben Hur mode into his uh, Planet of the Apes mode. Uh, he's just doing that mid sixties turn. You know, he's getting older and a little crustier. And uh, this is great. The whole thing takes place during the Civil War, but it's in Mexico. And uh, it's it's this weird thing where there's this cavalry expedition into Mexico. Uh, they're looking for this uh, this uh, this renegade Apache. And uh, the, the the Confederacy is is there as well, and uh, you know just a great performance by Charlton Heston, great performance by Richard Harris, uh, outstanding performance by James Coburn, who almost steals the whole movie. 
Uh, Warren Oates is here as well. Ben Johnson. I mean, that's enough testosterone to almost make the wild bunch go, you know what, we're, uh, we're going home. Um, tons of great extras on here. Special features include the uh, usual isolated score that you get with all of these um, Twilight Time uh, titles, as well as a commentary that's just loaded with film historian uh, know-how, including David Weddle, who sat next to me at the uh, LAFCA Awards when uh, I presented Jerry Lewis with his Lifetime Achievement Award. And Weddle, and Weddle wrote a, a wonderful piece. I can't remember what Glamen. I think it was in, in Los Angeles Magazine. I think it was in Los Angeles Times Magazine. Weddle wrote a piece on Jerry Lewis to coincide with that. It was wonderful. Uh, wonderful guy, Weddle. T- just terrific. So he did a, he did a great job uh, here. And, um, yeah, check it out for sure. Major Dundee. It's awesome. All right, Wade, as we uh, come, into the, uh, come in for landing on the show, uh, Strictly Ballroom is out. Strictly Ballroom is uh, La- uh, uh, Baz Luhrmann's first film. And when you look at it, you're... When you look at Baz Luhrmann's Strictly Ballroom, which is just delightful and it's fun and it takes all those, you know, ballroom kind of, you know, backstage musical type cliches and just runs with them big time. Even then, you realize how tame this is compared to where Baz Luhrmann has gone in his career. Um, but I just loved it. I thought it was just a little bit mad and a little bit fun and a great music. And I just think it's great. I wish Baz Luhrmann had kind of done all of his films in this vein as opposed to going off the rails with everything else he's been doing. And, and you know, in, in about a week or so, I'm going to have to talk about... Uh, Gatsby? Gatsby on radio. And I haven't seen it yet, and I, I'm, I'm worried. Uh, so I think this film is just terrific. Strictly Ballroom, uh, it's, uh, there's an audio commentary on it as well as a featurette and a design gallery, which is worth watching because the design is great. So Strictly Ballroom, good stuff. Yay! And talking about musicals, we're wrapping it up here. Uh, just a few more minutes. Funny Girl at Long Last is out on Blu-ray. This is a joyous occasion. We just talked a few weeks ago about uh, Hello, Dolly finally being on Blu-ray. And uh, if you're a Barbra Streisand fan, forget about, forget about uh, you know, what was the thing with the, that you talked about earlier on the show? The stupid friggin' Guilt Trip. Guilt Trip. Forget about Guilt Trip. Which I did not see, thank goodness. Uh, no, you want to see Barbara Streisand in her glory? Funny Girl, 1968, the am- most amazing Oscar tie in Academy Award history. Uh, everybody was fully expected that it was going to go to uh, Catherine Hepburn for The Lion in Winter, and it wound up being a tie. An honest to goodness, best actress tie with Barbara Streisand, the upstart young ingenue in Funny Girl reprising her great Broadway performance as uh, Fanny Bryce. And uh, the veteran, uh, Catherine Hepburn, who took home her third Academy Award at the time. Wonderful. Uh, legendary. William Wyler, you know, it just this is sort of the, the cherry on the top of an amazing career. Almost a decade after he, uh, you know, led Ben Hurd in nine Academy Awards, he directed uh, Barbara Streisand in uh, one of the most successful musical adaptations of all time. It, it, this is, there are so many g- great songs in this movie. It just I, I don't even know where to go. It is an amazing transfer. Sony just knocked it out of the park with this. Um, not a lot by way of extras. There's Barbara in Movie Land, which was, and this is Streisand, just a couple of featurettes. But uh, otherwise, this is just gorgeous transfer. Uh, you can sit there, pump it up on your system, get the music going, dance in, in your house, enjoy Funny Girl. And even if you're a straight man, uh, it, just embrace it, man. Embrace it. Because this is a movie that, you know, deserves to be seen by the whole family and everybody. It's just absolute wonder. It's just wonder. And, um, you know what, Mark? Let's uh, let's wrap it up with what? We should wrap it up with the only noteworthy television releases this week, which I know you're going to have a little comment on. Um, Star Trek Next Generation, the uh, third season is on Blu-ray. And uh, I have to say, uh, I actually quite like the third season. It's, it feels like the third season is when this show really kind of found its uh, found its footing. And um, the stories are great. The Borg stuff is just terrific. Uh, Best of Both Worlds is is just you know maybe even the maybe the bet which you know the part one was the uh, season finale, right? That's how that worked. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. and you have to wait to the entire next season, like to get five the, to months or something, to get the uh, conclusion. It's great. And then it turns out that what they the, the whole cliffhanger, like what yeah. they do, like Riker says, fire the big gun. Yeah. You got to wait five months when they fire the big gun, and then you wait five months. It's agonizing. Five months. They yeah. fire the big gun. Doesn't even work. There you go. Like, well, great. It's fine, but it's still a great, that. it's a great, great stuff. The extras here, which uh, is where I, I spent almost all of my time watching this thing just to get through the extras, uh, because it's really good stuff. Inside the writer's room is a reunion of all the key writing staff, and Seth MacFarlane moderates it and does a really good job, he, actually. He's a, obviously, he's a huge, huge Star Trek fan. Yeah, a huge fan. I mean, that's really, really interesting stuff. That's worth watching every single second of. Uh, Resistance is futile. 
uh, Assimilating Star Trek The Next Generation is a, a documentary that looks at uh, uh, several episodes and how they were put together. And it's really, it, it shows you just how much television has changed in just this short period of time. Tribute to uh, Michael Piller, who uh, was, sort of took over after Gene Roddenberry died and really kind of became the, uh, the godfather of the show. And then a bunch of audio commentaries and uh, an in-memoriam to David Rappaport, who died uh, not too long ago, and um, a gag reel, which I didn't think was really important. So really, really nice. And then in addition to that, Mark? Uh, we also have uh, on its own, Star Trek uh, Next Generation, the Best of Both Worlds, has its own standalone Blu-ray. Because they don't want people to get ticked off about the Part 2 not being released until the next release. That is true. So they, this was smart. This was very smart. It was they, smart. It was you might smart as well. to do this. Uh, however, they didn't just crap this out. They did a good job. There's an audio commentary by uh, Cliff Bowl, who directed it, and uh, Mike and Denise Okuda. They're the classic keepers of all Star Trek arcana. And uh, there's a new featurette, which will probably wind up being on the uh, on the next uh, Blu-ray release. But I'm a, I'm a big fan of uh, Star Trek Next Generation, starting with Season 3. So all Season right. 3, I think, is good, good stuff. Start collecting... Start collecting your next generation Blu-ray uh, Blu-ray sets now. All right, and with that, folks, we are done. We will see you next week. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs> no, no, not this week. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>